built to defend Mother Russia from a NATO assault that never came. Bloody in a war that marked the beginning of the end of an empire. The Heinz would pop up, and this is like, here comes the nightmare. It now flies for the army it was created to destroy. The Mi-24 attack helicopter. They are not alert out there in the field. If they fall asleep on guard duty, or if they don't guard their left and right flanks, we'll kill them. If they fail to secure their convoys as they're driving down the road, trying to resupply their troops, we'll kill them. And if they fail to secure the area where they're evacuating the casualties and they have ambulances there, we'll kill them. We'll kill the doctors, the medics, because we're going to bring that danger, that threat of danger, to every single person here. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. This is the OP4 wargaming base at Fort Polk, Louisiana. OP4 is U.S. Army speak for the opposing force exercises that 50,000 GIs are put through every year. The men who train at Fort Polk are called the Blue Force. Their challenge? Survive 21 days of the most realistic combat scenarios that instructors can throw at them. Three solid weeks in the field facing an unpredictable adversary across unknown terrain. Every gun on the battlefield is fitted with a sensor to register hits. Laser tag for professionals. This is the Miles gear, and every, every uh, soldier has the Miles gear on, they also have it on their helmets. And every weapon system has a laser on it. When the soldier is successfully engaged by some sort of a weapon system, then his Miles uh, will go off in a, in a tone and then that, that alerts the observer controllers that, in fact, uh, the individual has been hit. At, at that point in time, he pulls out his casualty card. The casualty card may say that he was killed in action. And, and in other cases, it may say that he was wounded. And then how he was wounded, then that gives the medical folks a training aspect so that they can use that in their own, own training as we conduct the medical evacuation off the battlefield. But every system has the laser systems, the, the stinger and the Avenger has the mild laser on it. And when successfully engaged, uh, a tone will go off in the hind helicopter that will alert them that they, in fact, were shot down. The airborne enemy they face, the Red Force, are actually op for instructors, masters of the tactics and technologies of the armed forces of the former Soviet Union. We're being brought in to repel the aggressors, the blue aggressors, those running dogs. So we, we will come in and uh, come in hard, low, fast, and hit the targets and uh, as, as quickly and as hard as we can do it. This, by far, is the most fearsome weapon at the Red Team's disposal. An Mi-24 assault helicopter captured from Iraqi troops in the Persian Gulf War. Codenamed Hind by NATO planners at the height of the Cold War, this gunship transport was built by the thousands to kill American tanks and troops on the plains of Europe in World War III. Instead, it has seen combat in countless proxy wars and brush fires across the third world, and now serves as a teaching instrument for the soldiers it was created to slay. For most of these gunners, this is the first time they've seen a Hind. They've seen an Apache, and they know how the Apache attack helicopter works. But this is Hind. It's something different. You know, this thing is going to take a good attack run. It's going to start coming screaming at you, and all of a sudden it'll break out of the trees, and there it is, and it's shooting the missiles, and it's shooting its machine guns, and then it's gone. They fly 
in the most heavily armored helicopter gunship the world has ever seen. Hind pilots sit in a titanium tub built to withstand point-blank hits from 37-millimeter anti-aircraft shells. Built strong, and there's steel in this aircraft. There's a heavy gauge aluminum. There's a lot of titanium. This is a very well-built aircraft with rolled armor plating on the side. It's a you know, strong, uh, tough, heavy, uh, durable, uh, very much like, uh, like its homeland. The windscreens they look through are bulletproof. Even if the glass were riddled with 50 caliber machine gun slugs, these two men would survive and probably complete their mission. The cockpit itself is a large, roomy cockpit. The switches are simple, clearly marked. It's air conditioned. It's got a nice fan up in front for airflow, keeping it across your face. And in stress, you, you like to have airflow across your face. It's overpressurized, and it's chemically and biologically filtered air, so you're in a safe environment till you have holes knocked in it. So it's quite a large, comfortable cockpit. Soviets, and now Russians, have never put much stock in high-tech weaponry. The design strategy that helped them smash the Nazi war machine remains intact. Overwhelmed sophistication with sheer numbers and brute strength. This machine, designed by the Mill Company and first flown in 1971, is no exception to the simplicity in design rule. Nearly two times larger than America's Apache gunship, the Hind has no real Western counterpart. Soviet military doctrine combines the speed of an attack helicopter with the size of a transport. The result? A hybrid. Larger than most World War II bombers and at 210 miles per hour, the fastest military chopper ever made. 30 miles per hour faster than the Apache. I wouldn't say it's a sneaky uh, type of aircraft and 26,000 pounds is not going to sneak up on pretty near anybody but it is quiet in comparison to its size and it moves we move at a high speed attack speed between 120 and 140 knots 50 to 100 feet above the ground and a rolling terrain it's very difficult to detect and it can be on you before you know it this morning we expect the MI-24 Hind to conduct an air attack the air attack route will go up along the east side of the brigade sector it will fly north, propose targets at Fire Point 706, 705, 704, and the Brigade Supply Area. On this day, the soldiers of the 25th Infantry Division face a difficult job. Plunge 10 miles into enemy territory and hold a riverbed running through their sector of the map. Along the way, they will be subject to ambush and attack by helicopter-borne Reds. Hind pilots do not fly alone. Included in the Red Force are Soviet Mi-17 Hiplite and Mi-8 attack helicopters. To defend against these threats, each platoon has its own Avenger team. A Humvee fitted with Mach 2 Stinger surface-to-air missiles. Hind pilots hug the trees, seek their prey, and strike swiftly. This gives each team an average of just three seconds to get off a shot. If this were war, these men would be dead. This is definitely the most realistic training that, uh, that I've ever seen in, uh, in 14 years in the Army, so this, uh, this is great. In our home station, we really don't have aircraft that engage back at us, so... Uh, We'll be on our toes as to more of what we're doing. Okay, he got us. Up four pilots fly five to six times daily. For the Stinger teams below, this constant cycle of attack forces them to sharpen their defensive skills to a fine edge. Okay, two seven just shot. Four more rockets. Then twelve individuals getting out of the MIA. By the time a rotation is over, it's almost like we don't want to go out in the box anymore. I mean, you get whacked three or four times a day, that's, 
Well, you know, we're, we're, we are pretty good at what we do, and uh, to, get, to get shot up pretty regular doesn't do a whole lot for your ego. Today, these choppers fly in mock battle, playing at war. But for thousands of such machines, the past is anything but a bloodless affair. I don't know about this one, but you know, you do wonder who, who sat in here, and you wonder where they are now, what they're doing now. Would they be surprised if they knew that what the aircraft was doing now? A lot of legacy to a piece of equipment like this that, that we're not even aware of, you wonder. At the United Nations, the Security Council was presented with a resolution calling for the immediate and unconditional withdrawal of all foreign troops from Afghanistan. For the Russians, this was not an invasion, just a helping hand to a nation in need. December 1979, two Soviet mechanized divisions enter Afghanistan. The socialist puppet state there is under siege by Mujahideen from the nation's seven Islamic tribes. Afghans incensed by a communist-imposed ideology that denies the existence of God. Moscow is fearful that the rising tide of Islamic fundamentalism is rising too close to the empire's southern border. This will be the first real test of Russian arms since the Second World War. Suddenly seeing all these young conscripts out on the air base, and they were all 18, 19, 20 years old. They were all trying to grow mustaches. And in a sense, this is like Vietnam déjà vu. In the early years, Afghanistan is a shadow war left unreported in the Soviet media. In the early 80s, if you thumb through magazines and newspapers that were covering the war in Afghanistan, basically you get it, an impression that Soviet soldiers in Afghanistan were raising flowers or picking flowers or constructing schools or kindergartens, and nothing else. We were briefed by the colonel who was still had the Af Afghan Afghanistan dust on his shoulders. He just, he told us, guys, I don't care what the hell did they tell you in Moscow. Now, let's talk about real situation. By late 1980, over 100,000 Soviets are fighting and dying in Afghanistan. But when the bodies of the dead return home, families are told that their sons and brothers have died in training accidents. Throughout the war, the Soviets control Afghanistan's few cities. The guerrilla army owns the surrounding countryside. They call themselves Mujahideen, which means fighters of God. The region is mountainous. Much of the country sits above 10,000 feet. In attempts to project power beyond the cities, the Soviets scatter fire bases across the land. Supply and reinforcement are difficult. Afghanistan's deep gorges and narrow mountain passes prove a nightmare to Moscow's conventional army. Soviet convoys find themselves under constant threat of sudden ambush by an enemy that then disappears into thin air. This rugged setting, the Red Army comes to rely more heavily on one machine than any other. Like the American conflict in Vietnam, Afghanistan is a helicopter war. 
And like the Huey helicopter in Vietnam, one aircraft comes to embody the Soviet struggle there. The Mi-24D is powered by twin turbine 2200 horsepower engines. Its combat range is almost 500 miles. The gunner sits in the front seat and the pilot in the rear. The transport compartment can carry eight troopers, but is most often used to store extra ordnance. The stub wings add 25% more lift in high-speed flight, reduce the chopper's turning radius, and can be hung with four 32-shot rocket pods. In front, the hind wields a four-barreled 12.7-millimeter Gatling gun. Over time, the Mi-24 evolves into a pure attack gunship. It seldom carries troops, except in an emergency. Usually, it is left to Mi-17s and Mi-8s to pull the men on the ground out of danger. You are in trouble, and if he's not getting you out of there, that's the end of it. And even when you're on board, you just hold your breath and count all along seconds before you feel that the altitude and probably the distance is long enough so you can slowly exhale and relax. In many ways, the Mi-24 is a product of the American experience in Vietnam. U.S. Army studies following the war in Southeast Asia determined America's Huey helicopter, both underpowered and extremely vulnerable to enemy fire. In the early 1970s, Soviet designers sifted through these studies and took them to heart. The result, an exceptionally fast machine that is nearly impervious to 50 caliber machine gun fire. And that was really something dreadful. And then you will fire on it, and uh, it will have no, no effect. You could see that sparking of hitting it and getting uh, sparks, and still it will come at you. I literally love it because uh, more than once it uh, uh, saved my life, and it was hit with uh, bullets and shells all, all around. And uh, still, uh, well, it uh, carried my, my body <laughs> back to the base. Soviet tactics often replicate the hammer and anvil operations used by American forces in Vietnam. Hours prior to a hind assault on a suspect village, Soviet troops are inserted into hidden positions along the villagers' most likely path of escape. Hinds would pop up from behind the mountain peak with the sun rising and the winds blowing into their direction. And this is like a this is like a here comes the nightmare. You you could scare you you uh, you know even Afghan Mujahideen, they were very brave. They were very good fighters. They didn't care even if they're dead or alive, you know. But you can see that feeling, everyone, that the way the helicopter was coming to you, it's, uh, you, you can get that feeling like, oh, it's something coming to me, you know. flee the incoming choppers. It is the Afghans who are ambushed as they stumble headlong into Red Army paratroopers lying in wait.
By 1983, Heinz roam over the Afghan countryside at will, seeking targets of opportunity. Soviet pilots name themselves the Grey Wolves. The men they prey upon call them the Garbok, or boogeymen. We were told that we had free hunting, that we should go off and shoot any people not using official roads. But it wasn't right. What if a man in the desert is just moving to the nearest village? When we first came, some people felt okay about us. But in a year or so, that changed. For Soviet pilots, telling civilian from combatant is often difficult. For leaders in Moscow, the distinction is inconsequential. Kremlin planners devise a strategy that many call genocidal. are bombed to empty the countryside of the people who feed, clothe, and shelter rebel fighters. There were incidents where, you know, villagers were taken out and just shot or bulldozed. That was a very common one where tanks would just run over uh, bodies. Quite a lot of documentary evidence came out about that. With, you know, children uh, <clears throat> buried alive through bombings, um, again, deliberate attacks against villages, sometimes as punishment for attacks by the guerrillas. Anything against land, community, faith, and honor calls for fighting to death. in the character of every Afghan. I mean, just to fight. And from the beginning, I had some friends here in the state. I told them that uh, the Afghans will fight to the last man. And they did, and I was not wrong. The Afghans respond to this escalation of violence the way they have for centuries, with mean, an implacable determination. The Afghans could travel on bread and tea and could travel for days, weeks, even months on this you know, very basic form of nutrition and they seem to have this extraordinary resilience for living on very, very little. We were escorting a column of cars along a uh, uh, mountainous passage uh, we saw nothing, then quite of a sudden uh, one car was set on fire, another car was set on fire, and still we didn't understand where from the fire came. Uh, and then it appeared that uh, Dushmans uh, were lying under camouflage fabric. And uh, from above, from our helicopters, uh, we couldn't distinguish them from the surrounding rocks. Sometime you could have feel the wind of the blades of the helicopters on you while hiding. Uh, and they waited until that column uh, was near that at the firing distance. Uh, first uh, hit and set on fire the first car, then the last one in the column, and then methodically began uh, to extinguish uh, the whole column. I couldn't do anything, and I didn't uh, know where the fire came from, and that, of course, was uh, a major uh, disappointment. For me, it was like a heart-throbbing experience, like, what the hell? What do they experience when we were covering our heads under the fire, and those guys just sitting in this, without anything they can do to protect themselves. Pilots spend much of their time flying convoy escort and over time earn the respect of many they are sent to protect. Their strongest bond is with the Helleborn troops they carry into battle. For airborne, it was like between brothers. 
and I especially respected that they never used their shoots when they were flying us for sorties. So if push comes to shove, we were in the same boat and they would not take any extra chances to save themselves or to leave us to just to drop us in the deep shit alone. Hind pilots often fly on what they call roadrunner missions, where, to present as brief a target as possible, they spend much of their time scooting just above the ground. Small arms fire poses little danger to the thick-skinned chopper. But by 1984, the Mujahideen learn a new trick. They take a weapon meant to penetrate the dense armor of Soviet tanks and point it skyward. Another unexpected thing we encountered there were the usage of uh, hand uh, grenade launchers against helicopters, which uh, were intended to fire uh, at tanks, but uh, at helicopters at low altitude. They had lots of grenade launchers, and a Moja head could just raise it and fire at you with a grenade, and there were many cases like that. You see, the, uh, the helicopters will come high. If you fire it like this, the blast will kill you, you or uh, at least injure you. So what we did, we will have these long, uh, tall trees, a poplar or some sort of a pine. On the top of it, a mujahid will climb and climb and climb. And usually, there will not be strong uh, branches to hold him. So what we will do, we will tie him up to the tree and then wait for the helicopters to come with the, with the RPGs. Over time, the Mujahideen, like the Viet Cong before them, learn that pilots notice movement. Running from incoming helicopters is suicidal. Once the guerrillas stand their ground, it is the Russians' turn to suffer. Hind pilot Valery Burkov entered combat in Afghanistan just two months after his father died flying an Mi-24 mission. Another Mi-24 was shot down, and my father decided to land his chopper and try and save the down crew. But when he was coming in, his hind two was hit in the fuel tank. So the helicopter exploded and started to burn. And he was the only one of the crew who didn't manage to get out. He burned up in the machine. A hit with multiple rounds in the fuel cell would cause a fire and subsequent force landing, catastrophic end of the mission. The Mi-24 is very heavily armored, applique armor plate, rolled steel up around the cockpit, except for the tail section, which is fabric. Fabric construction, easy to repair, but very vulnerable to, to even small arms fire. Eventually, the Heinz weaknesses begin to show. The altitudes in Afghanistan are extreme. Some Soviet fire bases sit as high as 18,000 feet. Here, the thin air takes its toll on turbine engines built to work no higher than 14,000 feet. Sometimes, this cuts the helicopter's speed by as much as two-thirds. More often, it means that the heavy, armor-plated machine cannot take off like a real helicopter, but must lumber down a short runway to get airborne. When pilots complain, Moscow and the middle company take no real action. Russia's idea was always to make a, a more cheap aircraft. The more, the better. The cheaper, the better. Uh, pilots were expendable. In the uh, Soviet communist ideology, people were expendable anyway. And the most expendable are the draftees, humping through the dust below. Now, most of these conscripts were non-Russian, ethnic Russian. They tended to be Georgian, Ukrainian, uh, from the Baltic states, Estonians, uh, Lithuanians. So there was a degree of resentment toward the Russians, toward Moscow. As I understand, Moscow tried to save more Russian kids because there was 
Russian population was not growing as fast as the population of Asian republics. And I think it was a very cynical policy of uh, Moscow leaders. So I think there was a lot of resentment uh, amongst the conscripts. They didn't really believe in this war. For many in combat, this sense of detachment will soon change. For most of the guys, they were more or less indifferent until they experienced personal casualties among their friends or they were wounded. Then, by blood, they were committed to this vicious circle of cannon fodder. Once you lose your buddies, peers, with whom you had a personal uh, experience sharing your life, uh, your service, then you just start from there. Then for you, it's like the whole damn thing personifies in the faces of those who, were peri who perished. And re the revenge is the war. That's it. And for them, it's, there is no difficulties, no doubts. It's as simple as that. They killed my body. Now you watch me. I think the fear element had grown. I think also the fear element had grown with the Soviets because word did come back of what happened. And if you look at the Soviet propaganda, which a lot of it was, was probably not that far off the mark, that if you got captured, they would skin you alive. And I always remember this being one particular element, that they would skin you alive. And it, it did happen. By 1985, the Soviet air campaign, led by the Hind, has added to a civilian death toll of nearly half a million people. One out of three Afghans are soon refugees. Atrocity gives way to atrocity. It was not a very nice war, and, you know, I talked a great deal with both Soviet prisoners and Afghans themselves, and I usually carried a copy of the Geneva Conventions, a cartoon book in my pocket, to try and explain to the Afghans that, you know, they, they should not kill prisoners. This was not part of the game. And most Afghans really couldn't see the logic in this. They said, well, you know, if we keep prisoners, we have to feed them, and they're bombing us, they're killing us, so why should we keep them alive? You know, which, you know, was, was their point of view, and probably from their point of view also, you know, justified that they'd lost uh, loved ones. It just fortified the views of those who spent some time there. It, it gave them ugly justification for atrocities on our side. So for us, it was very simple. When we dealt with the POWs, we would have only very limited options. He cooperates with us. If he doesn't want, he would be wasted on the spot. That's it. Nothing fancy. No slicing, no knifing, anything like that. With each passing month, combat in Afghanistan turns more savage. By 1986, even the children of the Mujahideen are willing to sacrifice themselves if it means costing the Russians one more chopper. Unlike the Hind, most Soviet helicopters fly without heavy armor and bulletproof glass. One of our uh, medivac helicopters was shot down by a teenager. And after he was killed, it turned out that he was no elder than probably 13 or 12 years old. When he shot the pilot, a bullet struck him right between his eyes from uh, probably around 2 to 250 yards. And he was, and he, he had enough guts to shoot from such a close range and to take all, uh, and pro I'm sure he had a pretty understanding what would happen with him, and he took the risks. So we developed the feeling of just respect to professionalism and to the other side.
1986 marks a turning point in a war already going badly for the Red Army. Early in the year, shoulder-held, heat-seeking missiles find their way into Mujahideen hands. Called Stingers, these American-made weapons are funneled to the war zone through Pakistan, compliments of the CIA. And once you locked in, the Stinger gave a sound that you were locked in. And, and then you just release the rocket, and then you, you see uh, white smoke, like a rope, going all the way. And then, uh, then you see a fireball. Then all the Mujahideen, they become very happy. When they shot one, they say all oh, that uh, the God is great, is sound, and then they fire all their, all their lights weapon into the air, is the celebrating it. A design characteristic of all of the mill helicopters, but particularly on the hind, is the, the inline drivetrain. The TV3117 Victor engine has a particle separator on the front, straight through drive that passes through the exhaust into the main transmission, which leads us to a vulnerability of the hind. The hot gases discharge directly out of the side on both sides of the aircraft, ideal targets for heat-seeking missiles. Uh, this is the Stinger missile system. What we have is the IFF antenna, and it sends out a signal to the aircraft, and it comes back to here, and we can tell whether the aircraft was friendly or a foe. What you have here is the, the sight reticle that he's looking through. He uh, uses this for, for sighting on the aircraft, and depending on what type of aircraft it is, he has uh, two or three different spots that he can place this in. Um, this is the grip stock, which is separable from the actual launch tube. This is the, the whole thing here is a launch tube, which is the actual Stinger missile, and the grip stock is separable. Um, this is a BCU, which is a battery that actually powers the unit. And with that end, we have about 40, 45 to 47 seconds to actually engage aircraft before the BC runs out of life. The General Dynamic Stinger weighs just 35 pounds, travels twice the speed of sound, and can reach aircraft flying as high as three miles away. Some in the CIA think the Afghans too primitive to handle the weapon. The assessment is far off base. The guerrillas are quick learners and possess a patient determination that proves deadly to Soviet air crews. One resistance commander exclaims, there are only two things we Afghans need, the Koran and more stingers. Well, you see, the uh, basis for 10 years of war didn't change, and uh, we used one and the same basis. So, however, you would uh, change the routes uh, leading out of the base and back to the base, the directions were still the same. Uh, so, Mujahids built up a fortified positions in the mountains on the general directions of our approach to the airfields and uh, our routes leaving the airfields. And especially when they got stingers, uh, they had people literally sitting with stingers, and if not in a day, then in a month, at this particular point, uh, an aircraft would appear and would be shot at. The most dangerous time was around 1986. We lost a third of our men and a half of all our helicopters. Most of the guys lost were in MI-8s because they are most vulnerable during landings and takeoffs in enemy territory. By 1987, flare dispensers have been added to most Soviet helicopters, decoys to any heat-seeking missiles that may lie below. Airplanes, too, utilize the new tool. Despite this, in 1987 alone, more than 200 Soviet aircraft fall prey to the American-made weapon. Almost on a daily basis, the uh, 
they would have a glass of vodka filled up with a piece of bread and a candle, and it would be like yeah, like a funeral or faraway party for somebody else who was shot. 1,300 Soviet aircraft go down in flames over Afghanistan. Nearly one-third are Mi-24 Hinds. By the winter of 1988, Soviet morale is devastated. There was not much of a discipline in the, their soldiers. Their soldiers were uh, selling their weapons, trading it for something. They were even selling their spare tire of their jeeps. They would sell fuel out of their uh, vehicles, they will uh, sell ammunition. In Moscow, the war is now freely debated, along with words like glasnost and perestroika. It is the Gorbachev era. For the first time in Soviet history, public dissent against a war of aggression is openly tolerated. Social fatigue and a crumbling economy soon undermined Kremlin's support for the war. In early spring, the Soviets announced their impending withdrawal from Afghanistan. In the months that follow, soldiers in the field focus on one thing, getting home in one piece. The Soviet Union has made a commitment to withdraw completely its forces from Afghanistan no later than February 15, 1989. There is no reason why they should not meet this obligation, and we expect the Soviets to honor the obligations they undertook in signing the Geneva Accords. There is no evidence that they will not do this. In Afghanistan, for some reason, you immediately became an old man just right after you were youth. I've seen eyes on young faces, eyes that should belong to very old people, 80 years old, 90 years old. Those kids, what they saw in Afghanistan was beyond normal human experience. And this was reflected in their eyes. It's like, we made it, it's like, from now on, it's R and R till the end of my life. It, nothing will be as bad as it was. That's it. Today, a small unit of guardsmen was marched onto the runway of Kabul airport. We were excited that we made, it. we were there, we made it, and now we're back home. Period. I mean, nothing to worry about. I must tell you that. I, as a correspondent in Afghanistan, went through different stages of understanding of what war is all about. In 1986, I thought that we need another two or three divisions and everything will be okay. In 1987, I thought that even if you send three more armies, you'd still lose the war and that something is deeply wrong here. And in 1989, I basically thought that this was a war that will not only destroy Afghanistan, but basically the Soviet Union. Many now say that the war in Afghanistan marked the beginning of the end of the Soviet Empire. Subsequent events make this hard to disprove. The last Soviet pilots depart in February of 1989. They leave the ghosts of 15,000 comrades and over one and a half million Afghanis behind. For me, the hind is a symbol of our Afghan experience. For me, it signifies, you know, like an accumulated force, all the 
uh, <clears throat> all the brutality, uh, brutality and power and, uh, of this conflict that we experience on both sides and against. The Red Army and the empire that this weapon was built to serve no longer exist. Those machines that remain have largely fallen into disrepair or lack the fuel needed to fly them. And although the mill company has plans to update the design, Kremlin leaders have no way to pay for it. On average, Russian Federation pilots fly just once a month, making the hind pilots of Louisiana the most active MI-24 unit in the world. Coming up next, witness the wrath of Mother Nature, real-life stories of rescue and survival on Storm Warning, then timely, topical, thorough. Discover the science behind the news on Discovery News.